shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have trod? Bid it crystal tide forever, glowing by the throne of God. Yes, we'll gather at the river, beautiful, beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the Our scripture this morning is from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Please hear the word of God. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you. And immediately as you enter it, you will find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. Then they went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, He went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Amen. If we would have uh, had Craig back up just a little bit and, and read the scripture prior to the triumphal entry in Mark's gospel, we would have seen Jesus in Jericho. Healing blind Bartimaeus, if you remember that story. So from Jericho, he makes his way toward Jerusalem. N.T. Wright, who's a New Testament scholar, points out that Jericho is the, is the lowest city on earth. 800 feet below sea level. And Jerusalem is about 3,000 feet above sea level. It's about a 12-mile journey. So you can get an idea of that being a a long, dusty, hot, dry movement from Jericho all the way to Jerusalem. 
By the time you get to the Mount of Olives, according to N.T. Wright, uh, that's the first time from Jericho to Jerusalem you really begin to see vegetation. Green, sort of the green we're seeing right now. We're excited about the spring that's coming. And from the perch of Mount of Olives, you can see the fullness and the beauty of the city of Jerusalem. So that's the scene that's before us as Jesus makes his way here into this moment, this powerful moment, as we, as the church, begin this week, the holiest week of the year, Holy Week, and Jesus is making his way into Jerusalem, this triumphal entry, this time of celebration. The whole scene before us is a kingly procession. It's a different kind of kingly procession. I'll speak to that in just a moment, but it certainly has that appeal to it. In fact, 200 years or so prior to this moment in the story, Judas Maccabeus had led this revolt against uh, the Syrian king Antiochus Epiphanes, who had desecrated the temple. If you read in the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel's dealing with all these terrible things that are going on, this desecration of the temple during that day. And Judas Maccabeus led this revolt against uh, that Syrian king, Epiphanes. And when he finally defeated him, he came into Jerusalem to cleanse the temple and to rebuild it. And he was met by waving palm branches and hymns of praise being sung. It's a similar kind of scene before us today. People spread their cloaks on the road. It really was a sign of royalty, a celebration of the king, waving the palm branches or the leafy branches, according to the Gospel of Mark. This, this act of praise and thanksgiving, if you look back in Psalm, I think, 119, it, it paints this kind of imagery of, of the celebration of the king and victory. So as Mark tells his story about Jesus, he understands this is what's happening right here. This is the, the entrance of the king of the Jews into Jerusalem for the highest festival, the holiest festival of the Jewish year. The Passover festival is about to begin. And Jesus is making his way in in this kingly procession as the king of the Jews. But as the Gospel of Mark makes clear, it's not the kind of king that you would normally see. It wasn't a procession of power and strength and might. Riding on the colt, the uh, donkey, as some other uh, some other Gospels will say, this sort of humble imagery. I like what one scholar suggests, that Jesus really sets this up sort of as street theater, uh, sort of as a mocking of the, of the powerful forces of the Roman imp imperial guard. One even suggested that Jesus' feet might have even been dragging on the ground as he rode this little animal. It's kind of an interesting Image when I when I when I ran across that this week this idea that maybe Jesus was even creating a an, an element of street theater I I thought of the uh, uh, the the play that, the plays that we saw this past week uh, we had an opportunity to go to the to the uh, performing arts center the Highlands Cashers Players and had so many of our folks involved in that Craig uh, starred in one and also directed one Elizabeth starred in one and. And, uh, and Lee Lyons directed one. We had so many people from the life of this church who were involved. So it was really, it was really a neat experience. I, I had been sort of uh, cautioned about the fourth one that Elizabeth was in, that it was a little different. If you saw it, you know that it was. And, and, uh, and so I appreciate the heads up, but it was, it was kind of a fascinating story. And, and I just uh, was very mindful as I watched that unfold. And Elizabeth did such a beautiful job, as did Craig. I, I was mindful as I watched that, that sometimes when we speak of religious things, we speak of it in a variety of ways in our culture. And some of the ways we even speak about religious things can make us uncomfortable. As I watched uh, Elizabeth's play unfold, uh, there were some uncomfortable elements. We weren't quite sure as religious people if it was okay to laugh or not, <laughs> but we found ourselves laughing anyway. By the time we got to the end of Elizabeth's story, there was this uh, beautiful message that this omnipotent, omniscient God, this God of the universe who is everywhere, is most often experienced in our human relationships that God blesses. It's really a beautiful message. 
was very much worth sitting through the uncomfortable points to get to that very valuable word. I, I, I offer that because that was just a bit of a reflection as I thought about Jesus setting up this, if, if, if indeed that scholar was right. I actually had never heard that approach, that idea before, that Jesus was kind of setting up this, this street theater as a way of, of, of really kind of mocking the power structures of the world. As Jesus made his triumphal entry in, in this very humble, very sort of weak and humble kind of approach, it is really a it is really perhaps a pushback against the other, uh, the other uh, uh, entry into Jerusalem that might have happened about that time. Pilate, the Roman governor, would have been coming in with his military steeds and all the arms and all his armed guards and all the people that would have been very uh, much a display of power and strength and might coming in to make sure all the Jewish pilgrims during Passover knew who was in charge. And so we have sort of a mental image of Pilate and his procession coming in, and then Jesus and his procession coming in. With a very different way of understanding kingship, with a very different way of understanding power. Well, the way the story goes, Jesus, of course, rides in. In Mark's gospel, not much happens at the end of that journey in, at that moment, that day. Jesus comes, he looks around the temple, doesn't do anything. He'll cleanse the temple tomorrow in Mark's gospel. But then he goes out to Bethany because it was late. You know, a lot of pilgrims would have been coming to Jerusalem. Jerusalem would have been packed. Hard to get a hotel room in Jerusalem during Passover week. Kind of like Highlands on the 4th of July, right? Everything is packed. Everybody is there. And so Jesus goes out to Bethany, one of the outlying areas, to spend the night. Setting the stage for this holy week. So what do we do with Holy Week as Christians? Now, those of us who are in traditions, church traditions, who live into the liturgical calendar, we, we try to live into this week in a way of memory and celebration. We do things to try to remember the story of Jesus, to try to live into the narrative of Jesus throughout this week. So I do invite you, I do hope that you'll take advantage of what we, what we do as the church to try to tell the story. We try to tell the story well. We try to remember. So for us, that means that Wednesday, we will gather here for lunch, and we will have a a brief time of service. So if you're in the area at 12 noon, and and you've got an hour you can give us, come and and worship with us for our final uh, Lenten noonday lunch. As uh, Ann shared and Craig shared earlier, we have our Seder meal, which is the traditional Passover meal for the Jewish tradition. Uh, We will try to be as faithful to that uh, modern Seder meal practice as we can. We'll we'll methodize it up just a little bit, but we'll try to be as faithful uh, to that as we can. That's on Wednesday at 5.15. And then, of course, we have our Thursday night, uh, Monday, Thursday, where we will remember the Last Supper of Jesus as told by the Gospel of Mark. We'll have a foot washing service. We'll receive Holy Communion together. And then Friday... As Craig shared earlier, we'll have the Stations of the Cross that begins at the Catholic Church at 12 noon Friday, and then we'll have our own service here on uh, Friday night at 7 o'clock. Trying to tell the story as best we can, trying to think about what it means for us to live faithfully into this holy week with Jesus. So my invitation to you is to take advantage of those opportunities and let this be a week of worship, let this be a week of transformation even. You know, we call this in the life of the church Passion Palm Sunday. And we call it that because it's very easy for us just to focus on the what we call the, the liturgy of the palms. That's what we read this morning. Jesus coming in and this triumphal entry. It's easy for us just to stay there in that point of celebration. And if we're not careful, if we go straight from this palm-waving celebration to Easter, we have forgotten all about the story that gets us there. There's a whole lot that happens between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. And if we just go from celebration today to celebration Sunday, we've missed some very important parts of the story. And so the church, somewhere along the line, decided to quit calling this just Palm Sunday, but Passion Palm Sunday, because we want to remind one another that this story 
lead somewhere. We don't want to just go from celebration to celebration without telling the story of the cross. I wonder how many of those voices that shouted out, Hosanna, God save us, praise to the coming king, I wonder how many of those same voices are the voices we'll hear come Friday, crucify him. I've always been fascinated by that. It's interesting how our opinion of Jesus can change when Jesus seeks to change us. As long as I can create Jesus in my own image, as long as I can make Jesus believe as I believe, I can be pretty comfortable with Jesus. As long as I keep Jesus at arm's length and Jesus is not challenging my presuppositions about the way the world is, I can be at peace with who I am. But let Jesus come in and I am challenged. I'd like to think that I would stay with the Hosanna crowd and not become part of the Crucify crowd. I'd like to think that. I'd like to think that about me. I'd like to think that about you. But if I am not careful, I think I will fail to miss what Jesus would do for me and in me in this season of Holy Week. So Jesus comes in a very different kind of king. He comes as the man of peace in a culture of violence and war. He comes in a, in a spirit of humility in the face of human power. I, I tell you, it's, it's more comfortable for me oftentimes to align myself with the power than the weakness. I want to be on the strong end of things, right? I find that Jesus, when I allow Jesus, when I open myself up to Jesus, Jesus challenges those things in my life. As I, I, I read Scripture contextually, it's, it's unavoidable. And as I came to this text for today, as I thought about this opportunity simply to think about this story from Mark's perspective, I saw it a little bit differently today than in previous years. As I was just kind of reflecting on this text yesterday, I I had the television on and I had these scenes from Washington, D.C. and all the other parts of the country where this March for Our Lives was going on. Maybe you saw it, maybe you didn't. Certainly, you probably heard about it. The students, the survivors of the, uh, of the school in Parkland, Florida, who have started this national movement or revolution, this national conversation about gun violence. Now, every time my whole life has been lived in the South, all of my life in serving churches has been in the Bible Belt, and I know that any conversation relative to gun violence is an uncomfortable conversation. I get it. But I couldn't help but think, I couldn't help but wonder, what does Jesus have to say? with our culture today? What does Jesus think of our culture today? What, what would Jesus have to say to our culture of violence in all of its many expressions? Whether it's guns, or words, and behavior. And as I thought about that, as I thought about Jesus in this triumphal entry, as I thought about Hosanna versus crucify him, I was reminded that this week, as beautiful and as powerful as it is, this week is about confrontation. If I could couch this in a metaphorical term, I would invite you to consider you, I, we are Jerusalem. I would invite you to consider what it means for Jesus to ride into our lives and to upset our notions of what we want Jesus to be. We want Jesus to be the affirming agent of all of our beliefs, all of our political views. We want Jesus to be an extension of us. I am pretty sure that's what some of the people who were yelling Hosanna that day wanted. 
Jesus, come and just affirm who we are. Take care of us against our enemies. But that's just not the way the Jesus we meet in the Bible operates. Jesus is always about challenge and change and confrontation. And so I, as I read contextually this story again, I've read this story many times over the years. I've thought about this day. I've preached Palm and Passion Palm Sunday sermons over the years, but I, I couldn't help but hear this in a new and fresh way as I thought about it today, and I couldn't help but wonder, what does this man of peace say to our culture of war, our culture of violence? Now, I think about that in big ways, and I think about that in small ways. I think about that in terms of what does Jesus say to me in the ways that I have supported a culture of violence or war. Now, maybe Jesus has nothing to say about any of that. Maybe Jesus is just concerned with the sweet by and by and has no concern about life on the ground. But if I will believe that, I best not read the stories of Jesus in the Gospels. Because Jesus was always about changing hearts and changing lives, and standing on the side of those who are oppressed and ostracized and outcast, giving voice to the voiceless, Jesus is always about change. And if that makes you uncomfortable, congratulations, that makes you human, because we are uncomfortable with those kinds of things. And so I simply invite you to allow Holy Week this week to make you a bit uncomfortable to challenge your presuppositions, your views on everything. Be Jerusalem this week. Recognize your own tendency to go from Hosanna to crucify it. And maybe by the time the week is out, those things within us, those things within you, those things within me that need to die, will not survive the cross on Good Friday. And maybe, through the mystery of God, we will truly become God's Easter people come Sunday. May it be so, Lord. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now. When